Why are Westerners surprised when they're exposed to negative and aggressive sentiments towards their countries from Middle Easterners? Is it so difficult to believe that anyone can harbor such emotions? It would be naive of anyone to believe that these sentiments have been there from the very beginning. Such despite is not innate, nor does it emanate from religious beliefs or teachings. So how does a people arrive to such animosity towards the reds, whites, and blues of the West? It's complicated, as there are many factors, but a critical one is how the West has never kept its nose out of Middle Eastern business. Western interests run very deep in the region, and since World War II, the British and the Americans have systematically been interfering with the natural and independent socio-political progress of nations in the region. The reasons cited by the West for their constant obsessions and intrusions are, in hierarchical sequence, the protection of their strategic interests in petroleum, followed by the restriction of communist influence, and finally, the guaranteed security of Israel. Over the last 75 years, the practice most commonly utilized by the West to realign the Middle East along its strategic paths has been regime change. If things weren't going the West's way, regarding either their capitalist intentions or due to any nation's unwanted political affiliations, then, coincidentally, a coup would take place thereafter. And this is how we won't stop with the pictures that were painted for mass consumption about the various regime changes that have taken place. We'll be looking at the stories behind the story. A first example of this simplistic formula took place in 1949. In Syria, the elected president, Shukri al-Qawatli, was overthrown by his military chief of staff, Husni Zaim. The narrative presented for mass consumption was that al-Qawatli's government was weak, and such fragility presented an opportunity for extremists like the Syrian Communist Party, the Ba'ath Party, or the Muslim Brotherhood to take over. This situation was further evidenced into question by Syria's sad showing and defeat during the Arab-Israeli War of 1948. But what is unknown is that during the presidency of Al-Qawatli, the Trans-Arabian Pipeline Company, whose investors included Standard Oil Company of New Jersey and California, Texas Company, and Sakani Vacuum Oil Company, tried to pressure the Syrian government into accepting and getting on board with its Trans-Arabian Pipeline. Such a pipeline would accelerate the transport of oil from the Arabian Gulf to the Mediterranean Sea, consequently guaranteeing fast and free-flowing petroleum exports for the international oil conglomerates. But Syria wasn't interested, as it was opposed to the major support the United States had shown to Israel in its creation and defense. Syria wanted to show its discontent. And that's when capitalist agendas sought the advice and action of the Central Intelligence Agency. For several years, the CIA had operated out of Damascus as its monitoring station for the Middle East. As part of its network, as Zaim had been indoctrinated as a supporter of U.S. interests, Records show that many meetings took place with the CIA encouraging for a military coup to take place. And surely, the coup succeeded and a mere four days later, the agreement to implement the Trans-Arabian Pipeline on Syrian land was ratified. For example, you say that all sorts of things were done in the field, for example, plotting to overthrow uh, the Syrian government and others, without the State Department being uh, very fully informed about what you were up to. The State Department didn't want to be informed in that particular instance. In 1952, Egypt was on the precipice of a revolt. Political reform was needed, but King Farouk was unwilling to make the necessary changes to the corrupt systems of government. The CIA, realizing that if it didn't act soon, circumstances would be out of their control, and they could lose out to Egypt to the surging communists in the country. The communists are winning, we are losing. And hence, Project Fat Fuck was initiated to pressure Farouk to action what was needed to politically realize a new and more progressive dictatorship. Farouk, again, was adamant to maintain his course, without succumbing to any pressure, advice, internal or otherwise. In an unsurprising move, the CIA flipped on the king and began intense meetings with the Free Officers Movement, thus supporting the extensive planning of the coup. Months later, the coup would eventually succeed, and Mohammed Naguib and Gamal Abdel Nasser would take control of the country. The king would abdicate the throne and be exiled. Beyond the regime change, the real intervention, though, was how the CIA would then go on to assist the revolutionary government to become coup-proof by helping establish the soon-to-be-feared Al-Mukhabarat Al-Amma, the General Intelligence Agency. Via the CIA's invitation, the Mukhabarat would become a policing entity heavily influenced and advised by over 100 former members of the Abwehr, the German military counterintelligence agency, the Gestapo and Nazi SS. As the experts advising the new Egyptian government, CIA agents would end up infiltrating Egyptian politics and the military up until the early 1960s. The future of communism in the Middle East 
depends on the action of the Western countries, not completely on the action of Russia. After World War II in Iran, the political system was a progressive constitutional monarchy, where there was a balance of power between monarch, the Shah, and an elected executive government branch. In 1951, Mohammad Mossadegh, a leading figure in the Iranian parliament, initiated a series of social and political reforms, including one crucial step for any nation's autonomy, and that was the nationalization of its prime resource, petroleum. Supported by his peers in parliament and in defiance of international business boycott threats, the Anglo-Iranian oil company would be fully taken over by the nation. The West, and particularly the British, were unhappy. A year later, Mossadegh, the member of parliament, would become prime minister, and in the upcoming parliamentary elections in 1952, the CIA would begin its interference in Iranian politics. Through the CIA's bribery, violence would ensue, and shortly thereafter, Mossadegh was granted emergency powers by parliament. The balance of power had now shifted to the prime minister. The West was now even less happy. With the assistance of the MI6, a few months later, the CIA would launch Operation Ajax. And through the bribery of military leadership and high-ranking government officials, this allowed for the Shah to illegally remove Mossadegh from power and replace him with his own authoritarian rule. Democracy in Iran would cease to exist from that moment onwards. But what was more important was that the Anglo-Iranian oil company proceeds would eventually return to British and American coffers. Now, if you look at Iranian history, the fact is, is that we had some involvement with overthrowing a democratically elected regime in Iran. Please subscribe to our channel as it would support us greatly in generating more content that documents our Arabian and Muslim heritage, history, and culture. Now back to our story. There are many more iterations of how the West kept on meddling in Middle Eastern affairs. Further coups, attempted coups and assassinations in Syria in the 50s, Iraq in the 60s, Saudi Arabia in the 70s, and other regional nations in the 80s and 90s, followed by full-fledged wars that demanded and implemented regime change like Iraq, Libya, and Syria, are all representative of the cowboyish attitudes that the West have in accomplishing their strategic mission. Unfortunately, the West has failed in all of its attempts to positively influence in any way the region through its clandestine or violent actions. The real end results from the actions of the West are how what were more progressive and democratic states at the time have subsequently been degraded towards suppressive authoritarian regimes, or the political and military vacuums caused by the West that have led to the disintegration of some nations or the rise and establishment of theocratic rule. And finally, back to where we all started, the resultant hate. Hate can be blamed and the West is to blame. Yet this hate is not for the Western people, but for the Western governmental establishments and the private military, energy, or industrial lobbies that support them. These establishments that don't really care for humanity, freedom, or equality, even though they constantly preach such empty words of manipulation while forcing them onto those who they deem can't survive without them so that they can justify their actions. And at the end of it all, and to be fair, they do actually care. They care for one single thing. And that single thing, is the almighty dollar.